Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Candid where we have real talks with real people. I'm your host Shanae and today I'm here with Selena. Hi Selena, how are you doing? Hey people, I'm good. All right, that's great to hear. So today we have a few things that I wanted to talk about. So I guess we can get the ball rolling on that. So the first thing I wanted to make mention of was the, the Department of Inland Revenue has said that all owners of short-term rental properties, like Airbnbs, like that are officially on the website, and also like just people who decide, you know, I have an extra room or efficiency, let me rent this out for $100 a night or something like that. Y'all know what I got from Them little rentals, yeah. Some must be little joke joke, but... <laughs> <laughs> so they are saying that all of them have to be registered on a on a government portal by April. And they said the goal of this registration initiative is to ensure that owners within the short-term vacation rental market are maintaining a high standard of service and meeting all tax obligations. Um, the acting controller said that their different rent- renters are operating at different standards, which is a big no-no, obviously, because we are in the tourism industry as the number one industry. So if people come to the Bahamas and then they receive poor service at a short-term rental that could reflect poorly on them, especially if they leave a review on one of these sites or whatever. So that's one of their goals to ensure that we have consistent standard and that I guess everybody has a good time. But I still feel like it's kind of, I don't want to say impossible, but it's, it's still kind of difficult to do that, even if you have a registry, but I guess it's a start. And she also said that many of the property owners are also engaging in unregulated activities, such as renting vehicles, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming without the proper registration, and as well as both without business licenses. And so all I feel, all I get, all I hear from this is they got in a couple of money. That's all I hear. Um, basically, basically. Basically, I feel like that's the whole motive behind all of this. But I don't know how I feel about it. I feel like on one hand, I kind of indifferent. I feel on one hand, I understand why they want to do it. But I feel as though how many things have we started in the Bahamas and haven't stayed on top of? So I feel like it's going to be very difficult to stay on top of of the registry. And then my thing is to, okay, you're making this registry, but how are you going to ensure that that these renters are meeting standards will inspections be held will will you come up with like a list of things like for instance if you rent an efficiency are you saying okay efficiency will have x y and z or if you rent in a one bedroom or two bedroom like what are like what are the requirements for these things that's my question like okay the registry is all fine and good we know who is renting these these this place but how if their main goal is to say we want consistency how will you ensure that consistency is 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 given to people because i could register and still do what i want with my property i don't know if i make sense i make sense you are but um like you i mean the motive with what with what they're giving it does make sense because like you said if they if and if you go on the airbnb site like you have like hundreds of places available within the Bahamas that do um short-term rentals, right? And Airbnb is an international app that many people use um globally. So I could understand their concern that um to have some regulation in place to ensure that those persons who are renting out, because of course they ain't care about us. They rent, you know, tourist them. Who rented out to the tourists <clears throat> to tourists they're at a certain standard and like the article stated that this is phase one so i'm assuming that they're going i'm assuming that they're going to follow up with inspection now how are they going to inspect all these places to ensure that they're up to up to um their standard manano but i do believe in a way it is a good thing at first when i heard it i was like i was trying to cut into people that money the government i was trying to get into that right but I mean, with with the motive of which they're saying, it does make sense. It really does, because you do have some persons who should not be hosting anybody. <laughs> they should not be hosting anybody. But hopefully, those persons. I think that's also to dissuade those persons as well, at least um somewhat from because for those persons who are who do have like nice properties, not not so much nice properties, but you know they have already have standards at least it wouldn't be like it would be like nothing to them now 
what's subsequent to come after this that's what's you know up in there because are they gonna start saying that they need a license to do this paying annually you know now what's what's this going to look like afterwards but for right now i guess it does kind of make sense well i think it, they should be i i don't know if licenses are required for short term like this i'm not 100 sure but i would assume so because they say to make sure that people aren't avoiding tax obligations because you know if you make over a hundred thousand dollars you have to now charge VAT, and there are many places that do short term rentals, such as I don't know if you ever heard about Brownstone, but they they have properties. They're not a hotel or a motel per se, but they have they they buy properties and they build like little villas and stuff on it, and they rent those out short term. Now I don't know if like for the average person like me, let's say I have a I have a duplex or a triplex, and I want to rent one out as air as an Airbnb. I don't think that. You, I don't think you have to register something like that, but I kind of think that it should be because because if you have multiple properties, when you think about it, you will be evading tax. Technically, you suppose you would you sh- it it would become a business at that point because this is the only thing or this is a source of income that you're bringing in in a sense. But I don't know how they would necessarily approach that to be honest. But I feel like they should keep doing what they're doing because if I have a triplex and I want to rent out one short term, why I can't do that? Why I gotta be the government? Mm. But according to the law of the land, you you sh- if you make it over hundred thousand dollars a year, well, first of all, you should have a business like this. If that's what you can. Yeah, if you make hundred thousand dollars, you gotta charge for it and you gotta put it at the government. But I guess in a way, like Selena said, I think it it could be it could be a good thing. I guess. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about was food security. So. In February, more than 3,000 people were added to food to the food assistance list, meaning social services is giving out money and food to those in need. And although it's great that these people are getting help because they're in need, it's kind of disheartening at the same time because it's like, why are there so much people in our country that are suffering, that they have to seek help from others? And I can't imagine what it must feel like to be in that position. And to have to rely on on someone else, but after those three thousand people were added, that means now that more than twelve thousand citizens are receiving food assistance every month. That is a lot of people. That is a lot of people, and I feel like yes, food assistance is good, but I feel like the government isn't looking at the big picture, in in my opinion, at least from what they've revealed to the public. Okay, yes, it's great that these people are getting assistance, but my thing is, how do we ensure that we decrease this number? Whether that be increasing wages, that we've we've known from time that wages don't match up to the cost of living in this country. And it's it's hard for a family to live off a minimum wage. Um, the, because the gap is just too wide. It's too wide. It's not like it's not like okay, the government raised taxes not taxes only taxes <laughs> they raise wages to two well 260 about 250 after nib and it's going to be less than that in july when they add when they increase nib to 1.5 of increasing by so let's say i don't know 236 let's just say let's say let's just stick with it not 36 46 45 so let's say 245 at the end of the at the end of the month you're taking home what a little bit less than a thousand dollars Yep. And it's it's been estimated that it's about a minimum of two thousand dollars to live in the country. So to to live in this country and that's bare necessities. So I'm only making fifty percent if I work a minimum wage job, I'm only making fifty percent of what I should be making just to survive in the country. So that's a really big yeah. That's not okay, four hundred dollars less. But that that's basically a whole thousand dollars less. I truly don't understand how people survive, how people make it. It's it's extremely difficult. And so what are we going to do to combat this? Because if you ask me, I feel like that's a crisis. And uh, I mean, the gentleman who was talking, he seemed so happy about it. And I'm like, yes, it's great that they get an assistance. But but like, what are you going to do to fix this? What is your end game? What is your end, end goal? How are you going to help these people? 
are you gonna make the economy better by by investing in in better how do you this? I want to say. I mean, are you gonna increase wages? Are you gonna stop taxing the poor like you guys are doing? The taxes are ridiculous, right? Are ridiculous, and I feel like at the the working class is the ones who takes the brunt of it because I feel like those who have those people who make lots of money, they find loopholes and they find ways to evade taxes legally, basically. And us, the working class, don't have that opportunity. We have we have no choice but when we go to the food store to pay that. We have no choice but to pay 65% on when we bring it in the car if it's not a hybrid or, or um electrical. And then on top of that, pay back twice. So it's just like it's almost like you buying the car twice. Yep. That, that's what we're doing. It's just like it's it's and gas is what's a bank on six dollars again. Like grocery is extremely expensive. Like it is difficult to live in this country. And it's just like I don't think that we are paying enough attention to issues like this, in my opinion. I definitely agree with where you were saying that. You know, we have to look at trying to decrease the number instead of paying out because, okay, paying out to assist these people, yes, it's necessary. And yes, it's but it's a short-term solution because now the country is basically going into bankruptcy and this isn't, it is just, it, the number is just increasing. So now what can we do to ensure that these persons don't need this aid? And like you said, we've been talking about wage increase, but yeah wage increase it is definitely it's definitely needed needed when you look around especially with um when you look around and you compare the salary rate of professionals to those in different countries it's like drastically more is more significant whereas our cost of living so the wage is there's a vast difference but the cost of living is basically on the same part. Make it make sense. Like, please make it make sense. Like, how a person supposed to survive, even in the working class, because a lot of people, when they think about those 12000 on <clears throat> needing assistance, they think about the lower class and and the homeless people. But it's, you wouldn't want to believe how many persons within the working class need this assistance because despite them working, I know persons who are working one or two jobs and still can't make ends meet because an efficiency is running at, what, 700 a month? Basically, 700 a month is the starting price for efficiency. An efficiency okay. of one bedroom is like, what? Between eight fifty to on the area, like probably eight hundred. Yeah, but then who will move in those areas? And it's not actually being picky, or whatever. It's, it's literally being serious. Like straight bullets ain't no, ain't no um funny thing. Being in certain environments, especially when you have a child or children, you you don't want to put them put them in these environments environment and it's what and it's it's and it's reasonable honestly it's really reasonable and some people would say oh well you just gotta live within your budget but it's it's not fair it's really not fair that you have to choose between being able to have a shelter over your head and the area that you live in like that should it should not be a case like there's a lot that has to be done within our country yet it seems like the from I'm look in my twenty my twenty three years, like literally, it's just the same thing being preached over and over and over within the two governments that Bahamians are always putting in. Then you just see these hotels erecting, land being given away, not given away, but being bought and sold, and all these different types of things to push tourism. But as we're pushing tourism, we're literally draining our country. But as I always said, we need tourism because it's the number one industry and it's what's keeping our country up. Yeah, yeah, people dying, almost dying from starvation, the the, the government going bankrupt. And like honestly, where are these millions and billions of dollars be coming from? Honestly, because they don't have money to pay the teachers, they don't have money to increase the um minimum wage to a to um a reasonable amount they don't have the money to do this they don't have the money to do that they don't have the money to fix up the 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 the, the, the hospital it's just like all these different things it's like what do y'all have money for yeah i it, it's a lot 
going on and i feel like there hasn't been any actual like plan directed that's telling us what the plan is in terms of wage increase or well, what do you what do you okay you raise the minimum wage by forty dollars right but technically it's not forty dollars because and i become a that and now their plan for nib is to continue to increase it every year which in I uh, should happen in my opinion because because of the way NMB is structured and you don't want it to be a situation where they pay up more than they get in, right? However, in order for that to work, you're gonna have to continue to raise wages because if you leave wages the same as it is, first of all, most behemoth companies without the minimum wage, if not without the minimum wage, they ain't, most of them are not gonna pay more than minimum wage for cashier jobs and jobs they deem to be skill skillless even though I don't believe that that's a thing. They're not going to pay you, treat, they're not going to pay you a living wage. They're going to pay you the bare minimum that is mandated by the government because they want to maximize their profits. That's just the way the cookie grumbles, right? But if you are going to increase the percentage or if it's projected that the percentage of NIB is going to increase every year thereafter, then soon, in a few years, we won't be making 2 260 anymore. Well, it ain't two sixty after you take NIB out. It's about it's about two fifty, right? And if you continue to increase NIB, soon we'll be back to two ten, and then it'll be less. And then what type of situation will we be will be in at that point? So my question to the government is: if you're planning on inc increase NIB every yeah incrementally by whatever percentage you need to, right? Why can't the same be done with wages? This is something I've talked about on the show multiple times we know what we technically know what the standard rate of inflation or the average rate of inflation is every year so why not just implement a system that salaries have to be raised by by a minimum of that percentage so if it's two percent every year raise we just by two percent every year and then we'll never have this long lagging gap like these are this i i feel like this is a very simple concept it may be a little difficult to implement to ensure that people are actually doing it and so on and so forth, or to actually sit down and discover what the inflation rate is for the Bahamas and how it is steadily increased and what would be a good number. But I feel like some plan or some implementation of a system similar to this is better than what's happening now. Because the last the last time minimum wage increased before 2022, was 2022 when it increased? Yeah, 2023. It increased January 2023. Before then, was it 2023? Anyway, it increased it increased the end of last year to the beginning of this year. I can't remember when it, I know it was discussed the end of 2022, but I don't remember if it was implemented in 2022 or if it was implemented in 2023. But the last time it was done before that was I think 2015. So that's a that's a really large gap before wages wages were increased again and people are still struggling. So it's just like we have to find solutions. We have to be a fine we have to find a way to keep people employed to boost the economy and to keep to keep wages and the cost of living somewhat in in the same range because a thousand dollars two thousand dollars is absolutely ridiculous to me it's impossible for anybody to survive like Selena said you know some people who work in two jobs and they can't keep food on the table or they can't stay afloat and nobody should have to live a sad reality and I know people per who have Full on degrees that are struggling because I just feel like the system ain't built for the working class. It's like either you got it or you don't, and it's like it's almost like it's meant to keep you down in a sense because we're fed this this stuff that okay, you come into school, go to college, you get a good job, and you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be set for life, but that is not the reality, and I feel like we need to start being more upfront, more honest with with our students. With, uh, with people and letting them know like how hard it can really get out here because that narrative is is not true although it can be true for some it's not true for everyone unfortunately anyway to move on to something that's a bit more light-hearted I guess in a sense yeah more light-hearted um that's great news in my opinion a new after-school bus system has been rolled out in 15 government um, schools in an effort to curb after school violence among junior and senior high schools in New Providence. Because as we know, gang violence is apparent and prevalent in some of our schools within the within the country, right? And as a result, it has led to to a number of fights and I guess disagreements between students, which obviously 
is not safe and this tends to happen while they're either on leaving the school campus on the way to the bus stop or walking to the bus stop or at the bus stop on or on the bus right and this has been something that educators bus drivers parents um and officers police officers have noticed and this is a solution that they have came up with so instead of children having to walk to the bus stop what they did was they got bus drivers to come to the schools the schools that they implemented the system in and children get on the bus and they drop them off along their along the route or whatever which i think is a good idea and um ut president belinda wilson praised the system for the good it's doing and says she's already seen a fall in after school violence and she hoped that the program can be rolled out to more schools within the country so president of the Bahamas Unified Bus Drivers Union said that the, initi the initiative is panning out to be a success. And he said the operation is not funded by the government and that the drivers are just trying to find a balance between servicing the students as well as the public simultaneously because, as you know, there's a large influx of kids. That's expected because we have a lot of churn. <laughs> yeah, so basically these bus drivers are vetted, I think, by the police force. So police force is also a part of the initiative. And they, they're there manning, I guess, the stops at the school to ensure that everything runs smoothly. And it's been going pretty good so far. And well, according to what has been said, what has been shared with, with the media. But I think this is really good. I think this is a good way to do that because I remember, I can't remember how long it was. But I believe it's like 2019, I remember a young man, I don't know if you remember, Selena, was killed in front of Blanco Bleach. I can't remember what it was like, no, but I know they were school kids and unfortunately he lost his life to an altercation that I'm not going to say would have been 100% avoided, but maybe if this, something like this was implemented, maybe he would have been on the bus heading home instead of having to walk there. I'm not saying that these children may not have been persistent and followed them home or hurt them in school. Those are very real possibilities. However, it, it could have been a, a deterrent. I think this is this is a good initiative. So I believe that it's a great initiative because I am at one of those schools where children from the different neighborhoods do have a rivalry amongst each other, and there tends to be a lot of a lot of fights because of that after school and on their way to school and stuff like that. So it is a great initiative, and what out and I believe each school has their own system on how children from different areas get on these buses. However, we have these children separated and coming out at different times and bus and to get on the bus. And I believe that once implement once utilized correctly, it 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 is a great tool. It is a great asset. And I just hope that the police do take their job seriously in vetting. Um because you know <clears throat> They be saying they vetting these police officers they letting in and stuff like that. And I be trying to figure out who they asking about these people. But anyway, and so because that is a serious thing, you don't want to take them from one situation and put them in the next. So, but other than that, I do think it's a great initiative. One or two minor technical things that can be worked on, but it is a pilot. It is a pilot initiative. And for the most part, I do believe that it's a good a great one it's a great initiative and i hope that um over the over time it's going to be developed and you know any kinks or whatever the case may be may be rectified yeah i i agree with the vetting thing i think the police helping them with that because you know police they have access to like criminal records and so on and so forth so i don't know if it's solely on them but i know that they're helping but i do hope that they are doing their due diligence in I don't know what the word is, vetting these people, because some people, some people who are bus drivers use their power to get to prey on the kids. And I, I would hate that thing that we do to our negligence that something would happen to one of these kids because of not properly assessing these individuals. But like I said, it's been going so far, so going good so far. So we're not going to look at the negative, but I just hope that we continue on this good path and that we can um, help these kids get home safely. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was, I don't know if you guys know about the, P, the 
Paradise Island Lighthouse Project. So basically two organizations are fighting for this piece of crown land uh, over PI. And it's been going on, I think, maybe from 2018 or 2019, but I know for sure it was going on in 2020 because I guess hosted for the eye opener a few times. And I remember there was this heated debate that was going on in the newspapers surrounding what was going on with this piece of property under the FNM administration, the last administration. So Toby Smith is a Bahamian entrepreneur and he wanted this land and lighthouse to transform it into a getaway for Bahamians and tourists. And he planned to do this over an eight year period. I think his budget for the project was about $2 million or something like that. Mr. Smith had pledged to create a truly unique Bahamian experience at Colonial Beach that would blend Bahamian history and culture with typical offerings of a beach break destination. And he added, that he wanted the proposed project to become an example of what Bahamians can do when we pull together to support each other. However, um, he had major competition, which was the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, and they're persistent. And of course, their pockets are deeper than Mr. Smith's because they are a huge, huge corporation. And Mr. Smith is only one person, right? So. Mm -hmm. In 2020, this is what was alleged, the cruise giant was quietly acqu acquiring real estate at the Paradise Island's western end to develop its beach break destination for its passengers and recent developments suggest that it may have moved closer to its goal. And that was according to the Tribune in 2020. That was a report that they did, right? So it is estimated that the cruise line has spent as much as $54 million in purchasing privately owned properties what? Yeah. That's a lot of property. That's a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, both of these parties were trying to get access to this land. And listen to me, Mr. Smith, Toby Smith, he was fighting Selena. Like, he was fighting because I, I remember seeing, like, I remember his name so profoundly because I remember reading the articles about him, listening to him talk about this stuff. Like, he seemed like he really was passionate about creating this, this this destination thing that he wanted to do, right? And he was afraid that the government was going to give the land to the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line because, of course, they probably would benefit, the government at the time probably would have benefited greatly from that deal, right? Because if they are 50 women just throw away buying properties surrounding the area on Paradise Island, then who, you know? So, Mr. Um, Toby even went as far as to say that he would sue the government if he was not to get the land and if he if the, if the cruise line was to be chosen over him. And guess who was representing him during the time? William Monroe? Yes. So this this is all, this was going on in 2020. I can't remember if it was prior to COVID. I think it was prior to COVID. But yeah, so there was this whole big thing going on, and Toby felt like he was being, because I, I most believe he had asked for the, pro, he had put in the documents for the land before Royal Caribbean. I cannot remember, but I think that's one of the things that we were talking about on the IO Plus. Right? Anyway, so yeah, and he was very upset that this was taking so long, and that the government was considering not giving him the land and giving it to Royal Caribbean. And hmm. they were trying to get a response. You tried. They were trying to get a response out of the FNM government, but they refused to comment on the matter. Oh, one more important detail. Also, the opposition at the time, leader of the leader of the Progressive Liberal Party, Brave Davis. <laughs> so uh, he is now our Prime Minister. Said that he was on the side of Toby. This is a very valuable piece of information. So last, I think it was two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, the Prime Minister announced that the crown line will be awarded to the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, which I found very interesting. And he noted that there was no litigation and there was no opposition to this to this decision, meaning obviously meaning that there was no opposition from Mr. Smith, right? And I thought that this was an interesting turn of events because I'm like, first of all, why this man was fighting so hard why does he all of a sudden drop the face of the earth in terms of not fighting for this anymore? 
full. And my next question was like, was he paid off or something? And then, but I don't think it would have worked. Or three, did he just get tired and just moved on? But who the person who grants crown land is the, the government, obviously. So why are you granting it to Royal Caribbean if you said prior to getting into office that you were on the side of Bahamians, aka Toby Smith? So that was mind boggling to me. And then my thing too is I feel like yes, for an investment in a sense is good, but I feel like sometimes we we prioritize it too much because my thing is if we have a Bahamian who has the money and the resources to develop and to invest in our country. He's a Bahamian who was born, bred, and raised here. Why is it? Why is he being blackballed? I'm not even by. I'm not even specifically talking about this administration, but the former administration who who dragged their feet and who refused to acknowledge what was happening. I felt like that was so. Of course, I don't know the details because one, I'm not a lawyer, and two, I don't know what conversations they were have. They're only giving us information, or they only they only gave information that they wanted the public to know, obviously, but. From an, as, as an outsider looking in, I have loads of questions and I don't understand why this is such a difficult decision. Is it because like, y'all feel like y'all need money? Like, I just, for me, I just feel like it would have been a no brainer to give it to Toby. I don't know. I think it's completely unfair to the to the gentleman, it's the behemoth person because- Toby Smith. Money, Toby Smith, yeah. So I think it's completely unfair to Toby Smith was happening. Yes, money talks, but at the end of the day, this is an initiative that he was taking for a Bahamian person, and he is a Bahamian person. And if your government doesn't even support you, then who else? Like, you know, and it's like, it's really sad because, like, we're basically just selling out, like what I said earlier, it's just the country is really selling out. And the message that we're sending out there to other, like, multi um, a multi building their com- companies and stuff like that is hey you have enough money we give you what you want and that shouldn't be the case and I believe like a lot of this stems from the position that we have ourselves in by having tourism as a number one industry again I I restate that we pump into this industry and it's literally eating and draining us out of money and I don't know, as like these people is have had administrators and person to advise them. And I'm just trying to figure out what they get paid for, honestly, because what type of advisement are they giving? Like, honestly, honestly speaking, what type of adv- advisement is there going out there to these to these people? Because it's, it's, it's not it's something's not right. Honestly, something's really not right. No, I definitely agree with you. And like I said. We only can speak from the perspective of what of the information that we've been given because we don't know the ins and outs. Obviously, they're not going to share all of that with the general public. But based on what we have, it just seems to me that, like Selena said, it seems like money talks. Like, we're not, we're not um, acknowledging the work and the effort that this gentleman wants to do. And I feel like soon, I don't want to say soon, but I feel like a lot of the prime real estate in the country is owned by people who are not Bahamians. And that's sad. Yes, I understand that, oh, if the Bahamians can't afford it, then they can't afford it. But then my question is, why can't they afford it? So, um, is it because we're not making enough money? Is it because we're being, that Bahamians are being stifled? Because I feel like there are a lot of wealthy Bahamians. So why aren't they, why aren't they, why don't they have access to these type of things in a sense? Is it because that they don't want it? Or is it because that they, weren't given the opportunity or the opportunity was taken from them by a foreign investor or maybe the foreign investor has more money than they do and I feel like that's kind of unfair right and we like to talk about other issues but I feel like this is something that we should talk about we should talk about the fact that the issue is supposed to be only owned by Bahamians but it's not it's owned by foreigners who have Bahamians fronting for them it's owned by by people from all over the world and that in itself shows a sign of corruption i said it's not that we don't that behemoths don't necessarily want to it's just that i feel like we're being stifled and it feels like after doing something for so long and after being rejected for so long you get tired of fighting not saying that you should you should just give up but it's just like if you've been fighting for 100 years or 50 years and nothing is changing or the change is too slow for you to 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 move forward it's like 
it's like what's the point we might so just leave it as it is and and then they want to they it's like we're stuck in this stagnant cycle and i feel like yes if you want to do it the fight for change but it's just like i feel like change takes money too and if we ain't got the money to fight these people who are basically the almighty powerful it's kind it's difficult it's very difficult this is just one of those times when you just gotta pray about it and hope that it becomes better also fight but hope it becomes better i guess Anyway, guys, we had an insightful conversation today. Thank you guys for tuning into another episode of Candid. Hope you enjoyed the show. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Candid242 to stay abreast on what we're talking about, what's going on with us. Keep it real, Bahamas.